this point, I hope everyone has, has seen my affinity for liking patterns and connecting dots within physiology. So today, without further ado, we got to get into the gut nervous system. But just a quick recap, you know, we started with everything is energy. And that still holds true because no matter what body system we're talking about, if someone's not well, if they're ill, uh, it's always an energy problem and everything else that comes along with it is a collateral of the energy problem. And then from there, we bridge the gap into the primary circulatory system, a bloodstream and all the associated stuff that goes on with carrying oxygen around the body and nutrient exchange in the capillary beds, which if that wasn't exciting enough for most people, then we went to the secondary support system, the unsung hero, as Mr. Perupkin liked to call it, the lymphatic system, which is basically the sewer system, the filtration plant, uh, and the one that actually takes a lot of the brunt of making sure that your body can detoxify itself on a regular basis. From there, we went to the respiratory system because you can't get away from multi-system dysbiosis, talking about you know dysbiosis of any mucosa in the gut, for example, will affect a mucosal in the respiratory system or the lungs. So today we're getting into what is my favorite so far and probably my favorite of the entire thing, just because um, I have an affinity for trying to figure out the patterns of the nervous system based upon the person that's presenting. And because I work with a lot of pro athletes, I get to see some pretty switched on nervous systems. So as per usual, you know, we got to go through some random fun facts that you can all use at dinner parties to be the least popular person in the room. So unlike the cells of your gut, which replicate every three to five days, uh, a nerve cell is quite possibly one of the longest lived cells in the body. It's also one of the biggest, some of the nerves that, you know, go from your spine all the way down to your big toe, for example, can be three or four feet in length. And some of those are not replaceable. So if they've been damaged, you know, there's a, a potential regeneration capacity built into them. Um, but severe nerve damage will cause long-term problems. So making sure that you understand, you know, the essentials of how nerves are composed with, you know, the proper essential fatty acids and nutrients being cofactors for building healthy nervous tissue. And then there's electrolytes, understanding that sodium, magnesium, potassium, all these minerals that that we're supposed to be taking on on a regular basis that are often deficient in a lot of people based upon dietary insufficiencies or water quality, uh, they need to be there in adequate status for those work, those nerves to work properly because they conduct electrical impulses primarily. So this is the electric body system. It's like the wires in your wall. Nerves communicate, and we'll get into it a little bit later, using electrical impulses that get converted into chemical reactions, which is an amazing thing. And most of the neurons we have have been established before the age of five. So every hit to the head really does matter as you get older. So the brain contains approximately 100 billion neurons with 1,000 to 10,000 synapses per neuron. So think about how many zeros are in there and the intelligent design of all that. And the, the cool thing is we're chronically pruning and building new neural connections. So the concept of neuroplasticity is such an important thing to educate your clients on because oftentimes something as simple as a Sudoku puzzle or learning an instrument or even exercising can actually, you know, branch out and build new connections that helps keep that tissue and that organ functioning well. The brain is mostly water and fat, you know, it's 65% fatty tissue. So a very important thing for the health of the brain and the central nervous system is getting adequate balance of fats and avoiding certain fatty acids, mostly polyunsaturates, things like high omega-6s, the toxic oils that, that people consume. And I'm still trying to figure out what vegetables and vegetable oil, if anyone on this call can tell me, uh, I'd be forever grateful. The last time I checked, it was all seeds. Um, and then we're into some of the, the structure and function. You know, the brain has 100,000 miles of blood vessels. It's an incredibly hungry organ because it will use 20% of your oxygen and 25% of your calories at baseline on a daily basis just to operate itself. So if we go back to the respiratory lecture and we understand the importance of the health of the capillary beds and the red blood cells being able to flow, so the gas exchange and the nutrient exchange happens, um, the brain needs a lot of energy and it needs high quality nutrition at that. So the first suggestion with anyone that's working uh, with clients who have neurological issues, gut brain issues, mood dysregulation is comb through their diet and make sure all the necessary nutrients are there because under the surface, we all look like this, incredibly surprised at all times. Imagine not being able to blink ever again. But for me, you know, I can't, you know, help but find the, the similarities and, and patterns, and I believe nothing is accidental. So 
whether you take from this that we are a tree or that there is a pattern in nature that connects things that communicate with the world around us and the world inside of us, uh, I think it's important to understand that a big part of a healthy nervous system is understanding the connection to everything else that we exist within. It's probably why Mr. Thurston is doing this lecture outside today. He's grounding, maybe he's got his feet on the grass, he's getting some photons, and Jason and I are sitting in offices like suckers absorbing artificial light, although my light's a little bit more balanced than the average person. So when we're looking at the nervous system, we kind of have to understand what it is at first. I like to call it mission control for the body to communicate with itself and the world at large. What does that mean? Well, everything in the body needs to talk to itself. And that efficient communication is kind of a proxy for health in my world. When the body can communicate with itself effectively, when a hormone can bind effectively to a receptor, when a nerve impulse travels without resistance, that's healthy physiology and healthy physiologic function. The nervous system is what I call the fast system because it processes input information almost instantaneously to create an appropriate output response. If I say that sentence in English, if you touch a hot plate, you don't need to think about it for three seconds to move your finger away. It burns and it's involuntary. And how that, that process is, is based upon the electrical signals that are then converted into chemical signals and specialized cells and tissues of the nervous system. Because at the end of the day, all nerves terminate in some area of the body where the effect of the communication needs to happen. The example that I used is in the muscular system. Nerves, like every other cell in the body, still have the basic fundamental underpinnings. So when we talk about energy production, we're talking about mitochondrial function. We're talking about the nucleus. We're talking about genetic material. They have the same needs as every other cell. So an important thing when it comes to understanding how to nourish the nervous system, because it's a it's a question that seems a little abstract to people because it's such a misunderstood or, or a lack of understanding around the body system. They need their same basic nutrients. They need their essential fatty acids, their amino acids, enough energy and carbohydrates to operate properly, vitamins and minerals, and ideally nothing to cause and promote inflammation that reduces the efficacy of that cell you know, performing its, its necessary action. The difference between a nerve cell and other cells in the body is they're far more energy hungry. They have the probably the most mitochondrial density per cell other than likely a liver cell just because of how much work it does. They're very fragile because if the brain's fat, we know that fats can be oxidized. So a nerve cell doesn't have a lot of support system uh, to prevent any kind of damage as a result of inflammation. And we'll talk a little bit about some nerve cells uh, and their, their immune system interaction with astrocytes and microglia. And they're also very slow dividing if they divide at all. But the important underpinning here is anything that supports the health of your nervous system will support the health of all other cells. Anything that will disrupt normal cellular behavior applies to the nervous system. So when we're talking about the gut, we're talking about endotoxemia and inflammation. That's kind of the story of how the gut-brain axis begins to become a little bit dysregulated. We will get into the different branches of the nervous systems, but the nervous system itself has its own unique cells. The ones that get all the, uh, all the glory of the neurons, they're basically the ones that receive and transmit information. I believe the unsung heroes of the nervous system are the microglia. These are specialized cells that help to regulate innate, innate immunity in the brain. So if something has crossed the blood-brain barrier, uh, these guys get quite agitated and they produce the chemical compounds that recruit the immune system. And if that is a chronic problem, that's what causes you know, brain inflammation, central sensitization and neuronal death. But there's other very important cells that work in conjunction, astrocytes to help maintain the blood-brain barrier, which is not too dissimilar from the structural underpinnings of the epithelial barrier, epididymal cells and oligodendrocytes, which build myelin, and myelin is an important nerve insulation to make sure that the signal can transfer properly because it kind of jumps from node to node around the myelin sheath. And always, 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 we're trying to understand the connection points between these two systems or multiple systems. So within the nervous system itself, if we look at the lecture that we've done, um, the lectures rather that we've done up until this point, you can understand that there's an essential need for healthy circulatory support in the nervous system because we know how much blood flow and oxygen goes to the brain. The, the nervous system has its own lymphatic system, which was just recently elucidated. So 
you know, for me, that's a really important idea just to know that we're still finding stuff in the human body. So the glymphatic system is essential for helping to drain out all the waste material that gets cleared out from processes that happen when we sleep, when we have lower periods of energy intake. So catabolic processes, if your glymphatic system can't filter out stuff that's in the blood brain barrier and the cerebrospinal fluid, well, then you have old waste material and potentially things that can harm the nerves, thus contributing to brain inflammation. We have immune support. So we're always sensing and intervening or not we are, but the cells of our body kind of, we are sensing and intervening with any threats across a blood brain barrier. And as I did mention before, because of the mitochondrial density, it's absolutely essential that we support brain energy metabolism because mitochondria from the first lecture, if you remember, divide from daughter cells. They produce daughter cells rather from the original mother cell. So if we have chronic brain inflammation, it's hard to get back enough energy to regenerate any potential damage that may come as a result of chronic brain inflammation. Nerves, as I did mention before, transmit signals from their cell body to other cells via electricity and chemistry. So it uses a gradient, oftentimes positive and negative charge from ions to generate what's called an electrical impulse. The electricity travels down the nerve through that, those gap junctions. So if you look at that graphic there, the myelin sheath is the essentially cylindrical aspect and the nerve travels between the impulse travels between those gaps. And when it reaches the axon, that's where the, the electrical signal is converted into the chemical signal. And one of two things happen. It's excitatory, it means turn something on to form an action, or it's inhibitory and it's shutting that down. So it's basically one of two specific responses and that's dependent upon the specific tissue we're referring to. So it goes electrical, back to chemical, back to electrical, and it just makes me have such an amazing appreciation of how incredible the human body is. I wanted to throw this quote in here just to kind of round out the first part. So taken as a whole, the nervous system is actually a complex branching network of systems with many overlapping parts and functions, all controlled by the brain and its spinal cord. That's why I call the brain and the central nervous system central command. It's the one that's always taking in information to know what to do appropriately, either autonomously and voluntarily, things like breathing, circulation, digestion, or things that are um, very much conscious when we play a sport, when we play an instrument, for example. So in simplified terms, these two systems act as switches to turn on and off organs, and it maintains the balance through all the different organs of the system with, through what we called the enteric nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, those two interacting. So we need to go through a basic fundamental background of understanding what the different branches are. Central nervous system is always brain and spinal cord. You can think of this as what I would call the central processor. It's like the computer chip. Uh, it's what takes in all the information and it knows how to appropriately send out the necessary response to compensate for what's going well and for what's not going well. Basically, it's a way to assess what's going on within the body. And you can see that each segment of the spinal cord correlates to the very individualized part of the body. And I don't know why this graphic is so um, sexualized using things like ejaculation and penile erection, but I mean, it does get to the point. That is an autonomic nervous system thing for those who want to know. Um, that is both sympathetic and parasympathetic at its finest. But this is where all the information comes in. It gets internally processed and it gets sent back out so the appropriate response can happen in the peripheral nervous system. So anything that's not the brain and the spinal cord is technically the peripheral nervous system. So it connects the spinal cord with your arms and legs. In the case of the voluntary side of it, we're looking at things like muscle control. So what happens if you're playing a sport, if you're at the, if you're playing baseball and you're under at the batter's box, information is coming in and it's going back to the brain as an afferent signal. And the brain is gonna let you know whether it's a strike or a ball to create the proper efferent signal for the motor division in your body, i.e. you're gonna swing the bat. And when we're looking at the peripheral nervous system, when we're looking at the somatic nervous system, those are the ones that control the muscles. The autonomic nervous system, which I think is a little bit more interesting to clinicians, is very much involuntary. This is where we get into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. And fundamentally, this connects the brain with all the different organs of the body and has a very reciprocal but seamlessly integrated role. So people think that the parasympathetic system is the, the brake pedal, 
and the sympathetic system is the gas pedal. It's kind of true. You can think of the sympathetic system as anything that responds to stimuli and the parasympathetic system is anything that calms you down or goes back to baseline once the stimuli has been removed. What's important to understand in the context of health, humans are all wired uniquely. Some people are more sympathetically wired like myself. It takes me a lot of time to rest and chill out. Other people are very parasympathetic, sorry, parasympathetically wired. They're very easygoing, a little tongue tied there. I'm too sympathetically driven right now. So when you're parasympathetically dominant, that is a better state to be in because parasympathetic is anabolic. It means that your tissues are able to be in the state of health. You're not depleting energy resources excessively to get through the day. The sympathetic nervous system kicks in when there is a stress in the body. Most people think of the classic fight or flight response. Someone runs at you with a knife, you get stuck in traffic, you're playing a sport. That's a very sympathetically driven aspect of, of being alive. The problem nowadays is humans exist almost chron chronically in a sympathetic state. And when you're chronically in a sympathetic state, you're burning through resources. The other thing to think about is the body will switch over to a sympathetic state anytime it's under any kind of stress. So the stress doesn't have to be perceived outside of you. The stress can be systemically internally, things like dysbiosis, leaky gut, chronic inflammation and mitochondrial dysfunction, all bias the nervous system to go over to the sympathetic side because they're trying to work with all these other body systems to address the imbalance and get you back to a baseline of health. When someone's chronically sympathetically driven, the other thing that's important to understand is in neurology, there's an old saying that says neurons that fire together, wire together. And what that basically means is the more someone gets in tune with a sympathetic way of being, the less easy it is for them to recruit parasympathetic. And if you remember from any of the digestive lectures we've done, we've talked about the necessity of understanding that digestion, digestive secretions, uh, regulation of peristalsis, which comes from the enteric nervous system are parasympathetic dominant activities because the parasympathetic system is what's for the most part drives the communication between the gut brain axis. So the enteric nervous system is the nervous system that exists within the gut that mostly takes its influence from a top down communication path. What that basically means is the brain, the central nervous system tells the vagus nerve, the autonomic nervous system, what to do, which finds a way to signal the enteric nervous system to communicate what appropriate events need to take place within the gut. And if you see where the, the innervations are happening, you can see that most of these aspects are controlled around things like peristalsis, digestive secretions, blood flow, the appropriate immune response, and modulation of anything that will stress the microbiome. So when looking at the enteric nervous system, we have to understand that if we're looking to get our clients' GI systems as healthy as possible, we have to consider what our client's default state of nervous system activity is and how may that affect the person that you're trying to support. What's the big picture? Because we know the voluntary and involuntary contractions of smooth muscles are regulated by these pathways. As I mentioned, localized blood flow, organ function and behavior, peristaltic movement, even nutrient absorption and the actions of the endocrine system are all regulated by signals that are either being sent appropriately or inappropriately to the enteric nervous system, which will regulate the gut. And you can see all of this is done to optimize the ability to digest and, and absorb nutrition. So things like barrier function, movement of fluid across the lining, knowing when to respond to a potentially pathogenic organism infecting you, that's an instant response to the enteric nervous system. And the gut will respond immediately because it takes only milliseconds for that signal to travel back up the vagus nerve to signal the brain that something is not okay. So when we're talking about the gut brain axis, there's a few different ways of looking at it. It's really a communication interplay between all the branches of the nervous system that I mentioned before. So it's the central talking to the peripheral signaling the enteric. So when we say it's top down, that's brain to peripheral to enteric, but it can go the other way around. It can go enteric to peripheral back to central. And we must understand the role of the sympathetic and parasympathetic pathways because it's not just an end stage illness or severe disruption where the sympathetic system is involved. If we're eating and we're not chewing properly, 
if we're watching something really negative on TV, that's really emotionally dark as we're eating or someone gives us bad news, that's going to trigger a stress response. So then all of the abilities that we have to signal those pathways properly will get temporarily disrupted. And it's really important to understand that it's not the one-time momentary disruption. It's the consistent disruption that breaks the ability for the body to communicate with itself. I think this is a really nice graphic for everyone to get familiar because color coding just does a nice job of segmenting things and understanding things better. So that's the background. That's knowing the different segments of the nervous system and then shifting the focus to understanding the gut brain axis. This is where we kind of get involved in being more clinical in our understanding. So we've established this, the communication has to be seamless. It's got to go from the central command to the external organs all the way down to the epithelial layer. So it's, it, it's essential communication from big to small. Those communication pathways are jammed up for whatever reason, or if there's a configuration that's not optimal, to restore someone's physiology, you have to really work out their nervous system. So, so getting the understanding that things like functional neurology, um, sometimes measuring things like heart rate variability as a clinician, and having a really good network of people who work outside just the physiologic are really important if you suspect that a client of yours is dealing with something that's beyond just a physical problem. When we're talking about the gut-brain axis, this is a very easy basic framework. So we have the bi-directional communication, the central, the central affecting the top-down and the bottom-up pathway, and the secondary effect via peripheral circulation. So whereas the central nervous system and its communication pathways are the fast systems, you can disrupt your gut brain axis via secondary effects. If you have chronic leaky gut and the bacterial endotoxins and inflammatory compounds that are going to stimulate the immune system get into your bloodstream and in your lymphatic system, does that intersect with the brain? Yes, it does. It can get through the blood brain barrier. And if you understand that process, then as long as your client has chronic leaky gut and gut inflammation via dysbiosis, you're going to have disruptions of the gut-brain axis. And it does contain three major systems that overlap. It's not simply the nervous system. It's the nervous system speaking and interacting with the immune and endocrine systems. So it's a disruption of communication across the board, and it uses various metabolites, neurotransmitters, hormones, and even bacterial components for the body to be able to communicate with itself. So this is the basic overarching framework. A more advanced understanding with an example is a healthy communication pathway is the central nervous system sends a communication pathway signal to the enteric nervous system, which coordinates and regulates processes. So if I eat food, my brain recognizes that I'm eating food. It's going to signal my stomach to start making stomach acid. It's going to signal my pancreas and my gallbladder to make enzymes and bile respectively. And it's going to allow the churning of the, the stomach acid to denature proteins when that's done appropriately, the contents of my stomach are going to enter into my small intestine, and it's going to move through my small intestine at an appropriate speed to be able to absorb and break down the nutrition properly. And thus, my microbiome is made happy, maintained and is happy, and I can signal the feedback up to my brain once I've eaten that everything's good and I can digest. The opposite is true. If we have a compromised gut-brain axis, then the communication that goes to the ENS is faulty. I might not make enough stomach acid, which is why HCL is important. I might not make enough enzymes or bile, which is why digestive support is essential for people struggling with gut brain issues. And if I don't move things through my system appropriately in terms of speed, well, if it goes through my system too quickly, I don't absorb food properly. If it goes through my system too slowly, I start reabsorbing waste material and I start to disrupt chronically the normal communication pathways between my gut brain axis. And what is that going to do for my microbiome? It's going to change the status of diversity. It's going to change the status of pot potential pathogens, which is going to change the status of the products they produce. And if that gut becomes compromised and we start leaking things into our peripheral circulatory systems, we recruit the immune system, which upregulates the inflammatory response, which deregulates the integrity of the blood brain barrier. And now we've completed our pathway of compromise cycle. And everyone, in my opinion, who is struggling with a, a gut brain issue, who may display with various aspects of mood dysregulation, 
depression, anxiety, chronic gut issues, um, along with those things, that's the pattern interplay of what's really going on with them. And we as clinicians have to reverse engineer the process of getting them supported first with the right supplements and then figuring out how to support their physiology and getting them back on track. Because this is one of the most important uh, slides in, in the entire lecture, in my opinion. When we have you know, normal signaling processes, we have healthy vagal tone. If we have healthy vagal tone, we can get into that parasympathetic state and our bodies can be anabolic, it can rebuild new tissue and we can maintain health. Thus, we've maintained a healthy digestive response and all the factors that I just mentioned regarding our microbi right, microbial community, they're enriched, there's good diversity, they're making the appropriate short chain fatty acids They're making butyrate to produce adequate energy for our colonocytes. That's going to keep inflammation low and it's going to allow our immune systems to be ideally regulated. We can raise inflammation when we need to, and we can calm inflammation down once the threat's gone and that's healthy aging. On the other side of the coin, we have the entire opposite part of the process, altered gut metabolites, gut permeability, driving systemic inflammation. Systemic inflammation drives a sympathetic nervous system response, which down-regulates vagal tone so we can't get into parasympathetic. And then we have what's called an endocrine compensation response, i.e. your HPA axis, your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal is always pumping out cortisol to deal with the stress. Why? Because cortisol is an anti-inflammatory substance in the body. And I like to say compensation until generate degeneration because it rhymes and it's easy to remember. Meaning... The body will compensate until it can't anymore. I've said that multiple times. And it's up to us to figure out the patterns that our clients are presenting to, to ideally allow their physiology to get back to baseline. Because in summary, it's really all right here. You know, regardless if it's an external stressor, it's going to create an internal response always. If it's an internal stressor, it's also going to create a systemic response. So we're going to have changes in the nervous system changes in behavioral expression inside the body via things like the overgrowth of pathogens, the overgrowth of yeast, fungus, and parasites. And, you know, it, the irony of, of me doing this lecture, the last time I lectured, I was in Costa Rica and I had a lot of fun there. And I also picked up a parasite or something that has rocked my GI system. And I can tell you, putting this lecture together and revamping it with brain fog and transient nature is not easy. <laughs> so I can attest to the simple fact that the minute you disrupt your normal microbiome, everything about you feels different and it usually doesn't feel better. So understanding that we need to know these patterns of interplay if we're gonna know how to look at a problem. It doesn't necessarily tell you what move to make. Jason and I will get into some of the supplemental measures but understanding the nature of how this system is created and how the, the network of communication is just trying to be efficient, it's like any relationship. Any relationship is built upon healthy communication. And when things start to get disrupted, things fall apart. In the, the nature of time, I won't go through this, but this is a really awesome study that uh, I found from 2021, looking at the different aspects of the gut brain axis and how the microbiome can create different neuroactive compounds producing neurotransmitters, um, how different species of bacteria are able to produce things like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, adrenaline, how they can drive the enteroendocrine cells to up or down regulate the production of hormones, and how even some of those precursors, like bacteria can take amino acids, chemically modify them, send them into the bloodstream, and then they can actually be made into neurotransmi neurotransmitters in the brain. It's incredible. So I, I put a link to the article for those who want to uh, do a little bit more digging, because if you work with anyone who has chronic degenerative issues that are neurological in nature, things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, schizophrenia, dementia, early onset cognitive decline, we're just learning about this stuff. Like we're not there yet to know what moves to make. I think we're just starting to put the puzzle together of understanding the interconnectedness of the human and that all the neuroactive compounds that we use to give people who are depressed are being made in the gut. And we don't know what effects they have when they're taken orally. Do they disrupt the neurotransmitter balance in the gut? Potentially. So that's an area of research that I'm going to be focusing on because I think it's absolutely essential because I think the standard of care, and I can say this from watching my own family struggle with this, the standard of care for neurological disease is similar to that of autoimmunity and cancer. These people need a lot of help and there's a lot that we can do 
when we cross pollinate with, with other physicians and, and we come together. So when it comes to approaching the gut brain axis, lifestyle is an essential thing, you know, your internal environment. And I don't mean just by the, that inside of your body, what's your mind state like your emotional control? Do you have, you know, toxic thoughts or stinking thinking, as they say, um, because what your nervous system experience really matters. Are you, are you the kind of person who needs to set the room on fire to feel comfortable? Or can you enjoy nice, quiet relaxation where you're not disrupted and you can really get into that chill state? How and what you eat matters a lot. How you eat is more important sometimes than what you eat. Because if you eat the best diet in the world, you know, by shoveling it in your face and not chewing and not getting into that proper state to absorb food, you're going to be nutri nutritionally deficient because your GI system is not going to show up for you. So making sure that you're getting, you know, all the basis of essential proteins that you need from high quality sources, making sure that you're minimizing the intake of toxic fats and simple carbohydrates, eating nutrient dense foods with a wide variety of colors and fiber, not overeating protein is a great starting point. And then personalizing it to your client from there um, is always an essential thing. Strategic supplementation, we'll go through some of that, but there are certain things outside the bounds of GI focused supplements that are really powerful and really beneficial for certain clients. Uh, and they respond really well when they're dealing with, you know, a lot of gut brain dysregulation, things like ketones, vitamins and minerals, things that produce or promote the, the secretions of GABA, because we want to eventually allow our clients to become in a chronically relaxed state so they can regulate their circad circadian rhythm and sleep. Because without those two, these people actually spiral down even quickly, even more quickly. Circadian rhythm is the regulation of light cycles. And a lot of people who work shift work, for example, do suffer from neurological issues as a result of having their time zones or their light cycles entirely flipped, and they don't get quality sleep. You need a, a minimum of six to eight hours of sleep on a regular basis, but you need to cycle properly through those different sleep cycles. So things like caffeine and sugar can disrupt restful sleep. And then there's exercise. Exercise is a double-edged sword. It can be incredibly beneficial unless it's too stressful. I always say when, you, when you're going for PRs in the gym or you're, you're exercising to abuse yourself, that can disrupt normal gut function. It can chronically activate the sympathetic nervous system, and it can actually slowly start to push you away from health via chasing performance. So understanding exercise as, as an appropriate prescription, just like everything else, is essential in working with these kinds of populations. So the four areas that we're going to kind of focus on today is the role of the nervous system. For me, it's the overall health and fitness of your nervous system. And it's really defined by making sure it can communicate as effectively and seamlessly as possible. The role of digestion, the thoroughness of each process, you know, each thing depends upon what precedes it. The, the stomach's digestion will influence bile and, and pancreatic secretions, for example. So we want to make sure that we're always supporting digestion, regardless of the condition, because when you take care of the gut, everything in the body gets better. The role of the microbiome, dysbiosis and inflammation versus eubiosis and a healthy immune response. It really does seem to be that the one commonality in each of these lectures is that chronic pro-inflammatory dysbiosis, which drives leaky gut, which drives a systemic immune response, seems to be at you know the core of all these issues or a common theme with all these issues. So if you can restore function there, the body can finally just take a sigh of relief because it can finally relax from the chronic bombardment of pro-inflammatory response and begin the healing process, which brings us to the role of the brain because neural inflammation will compromise brain function and it does have a systemic influence in two ways. If the brain's getting bombarded, the systemic issues are affecting the brain, but the brain regulates the communication for the rest of the body. So looking at these four categories, you know, take a moment and think about all of your clients with mood dysregulation. What's their gut health like? It's probably a connection there. And if you're working with clients who are dealing with gut issues, what are their mental states like? Most people who have chronic gut issues are not the happiest people in the room. And you understand why you can have empathy for them, but it, there's a very strong physiologic connection going on there that I'm hoping that, you know, we've elucidated some of the things that need to be drawn as conclusions. Sometimes getting access to, to more advanced technology, this is an example of running a heart rate variability test where you can actually plot someone's sympathetic and parasympathetic response just based upon having them do some simple things like breathing, lying down, 
breathing standing up, doing some deep breathing exercises. Because if you understand someone's pattern, you can understand what may push them into the sympathetic pro-inflammatory fight or flight state and maybe develop some strategies in addition to your diet and supplemental regimes that will bring them back into a better health state and ultimately start to rewire the nervous system. So that's a lot of stuff right there. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Starsky and Hutch. I think are ready to report for duty. <laughs> you good to go. Yes, sir, man. You just, uh, you spit out a lot of information very quickly there, sir. Thank you. I wanted to make sure we got through it. We didn't rush through the products because I know that's what a lot of people really want to know. So uh, anything to add before we get into the, the meat and potatoes of the products? A few things, but you did it so magically. Let's just rock. Let's do it. All right. So glue design. We're not talking just gluten support here. We're talking about systemic immune response, maybe driven by, you know, the consumption of dairy, the consumption of, of gluten containing grains. They create Soy. these compounds like gluteomorphins. And I've, I know that they have a, an inflammatory response in the body, but you have a lot more clinical use with this. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. So DPP-4 peptidase is dramatically reduced by several drugs that most of our patients are taking, mostly diabetic source. And research has shown that a reduction or depletion in this enzyme produces neurologic pain and neurologic conditions across the board and also chronic hormonal conditions, which, could, which is what we're going to get into next month. And also the consumption of dairy past like 1955 drops this enzyme right out of the works. So this enzyme used not only for your cross-contamination when you eat out, but taken systemically for your patients at night will rebuild this enzyme depletion and get your patients out of chronic pain, which is going to affect the gut brain access and completely reduce that de depletion of that enzyme that is creating so much neuroinflammation that's coming also from the gut and from too much zonulin being present in the gut and let people actually calm down. So a, a wild, like out of the box, beautiful product for this specific issue with your patients. And in, what's important to recognize is how much activity is in the product that you're using. So maybe Roland, I'll flip it back on you and you can go through that piece. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to add as well, if anyone's working with children, you know, a lot of behavioral problems connect to food and, and dietary consumption of these pro-inflammatory foods, dairy, as you mentioned, and, um, and then grains, gluten containing grains, because we can't break them down. And if, if those get past the gut barrier and into the circulatory system, it's the job of the immune system to break them down before they convert into these things that are called gluteo and caseomorphine. So this is also a really good product to help bridge the gap of breaking that a food addiction that a lot of people have to, to things like dairy and grains, because it's actually a neurological feedback thing that is also connected to inflammation. But you made a good point. Most DPP-4s on the market aren't all that strong, from my understanding. So we have the strongest DPP-4, like hands down. Well, to be fair, we looked at as many products as we possibly could on the market, you know, from our line, you know, the, the doctor style line. And we couldn't find anything over um, 1500 units of activity. And this one has 15,000. So it's just a classic example of if we want to get to therapy with few pills, which, you know, our doctors are tired of this pill fatigue as much as we are. And this is you know part of our mission. You know, this is a, a beautiful answer where you can just have your patient you know, just take one of these with a meal or at, you know, at night, especially people that have a really hard time sleeping that are on some of these, you know, medications or that you're having a hard time. You've gone through neurotransmitters, you've gone through the gallbladder, you've gone through, you know, melatonin, you've gone through the hormones. This could be a huge solution because the gut brain axis is never going to connect back if your patient isn't sleeping. Yeah. So taking it for gluten residue support with meals systemically Casein. is empty yep. stomach prior to bed, one capsule, the two capsules with food, likely two capsules before bed on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Maximum. Yeah. And maybe one with a child for a child, a small kid. 
Yeah, and and even with this, you could half it. Got and the it. taste, the taste isn't bad, and you know it's not going to be a concern with stomach acid or anything like that. Yeah, an underrated product for sure. We're touching on biomzyme. We haven't featured this probiotic. It's the only probiotic under the U.S. Enzymes banner. So you know we've talked about Theralac Pro, we've talked about True Bifido Pro, and True Flora. What's really cool is you know we target probiotics for for certain scenarios or conditions, right? Theralac systemic support. For me, I always consider Theralac as good recovery after, you know, using antibiotics. It has the ability to both produce pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it's more of an immune modulating, balancing probiotic, if you will. True Flora is small intestinal support. It's really good for helping to eradicate fungal infestations. Uh, it's got, you know, the enzymes in conjunction with yep. uh, lactic acid producers. So it's really good there. Trubifido is the colonic formula that's also only producing anti-inflammatory cytokines. So biomzyme is kind of the diversity play. Is that fair to say? It is. This is what we want to use once we have our patients on the way to recovery and to keep them there and to have something that we constantly are able to like rotate them on and off. Yes, there's going to be times we need to put them back on the Trubif or the, you know, the True Flora or the Theralac Pro, but this is going to kind of be the ongoing player. It's got spore-based bacteria in there, just a wide range of organisms to just kind of keep us in that beautiful balance once it's there. So again, not so we're just fighting or targeting. This is more this, that broad spectrum, like, hey, we feel like we're maybe in the zone. Let's try to do it our best to keep it there. Yeah. I mean, the, the one common theme of today's lecture when it came to discussing the microbiome was, you know, diversity is, is a huge thing to help regulate because what people need to understand is there's always a war going on in your intestines. The good guys, and this is overly simplified, are always kind of trying to silence or eradicate the bad guys. And modern lifestyle with the quality of the water that we drink and the food we eat, the lack of food diversity and fiber diversity starts to thin the microbiome's diversity processes or diversity nature over time. So in conjunction with restoring some of those signals, using Biomzyme on an ongoing basis for clients who aren't dealing with anything major, just to anchor it at one to two capsules a day um, in a cyclic nature is a great starting point. Yeah. And just, just for a, a prime example of that, Troy, you know, the epitome of health, you know, our Martin, mountain climber, like this is in his regimen. This is what he takes unless he's feeling something's coming on or he's ill, then he'll switch. But when he feels like he's at his best or he's getting ready to you know, hit the next mountain or climb Everest, this is going to be in the batch. A hundred percent. And always remember, if, if you want more information from your reps, reach out to them. If you want to get in a call with Jason and I, we can go through these in, in finer detail. Uh, Sun Balance is one of my favorite products. I've used this off and on. I use this when I got that Lyme infection last year. It, it kind of saved me from being able to think or not think, maybe that's a better way of putting it. <laughs> so we talked about the four areas of focus. To me, sun, sun balance is brain. This is our best product for dealing with brain inflammation, full stop. Without a doubt. So we can just maybe start with the three ingredients. So PEA does a billion things, but one thing that it really does well, which you mentioned several times in your lecture, is create peristalsis. So that is hugely important for, you know, vagal tone and all the other things that we talked about. But then it contains two very potent and super clean bioflavonoids, which we know are some of the best things to calm down brain inflammation. So, and they're at doses, which in, within three capsules are going to hit basically all the research that we've seen. So, you know, I'll let you take it from here from, you know, maybe some of your personal experiences. And of course, Dr. Kelly Halderman, for those of you that know her, helped us, you know, formulate this like nine years ago before anyone was talking about PEA, luteolin, and, and some of these, some of these things. Yeah. Brain inflammation is, is, is of critical nature to understand the fragility of what can happen if it goes unregulated. So if the brain's mostly fat, if the neurons are quite fragile, um, it's easy for the innate immune system in the brain to raise an inflammatory response. They produce pro-inflammatory cytokines that are in response to a threat that crosses the blood-brain barrier. And chronic inflammatory cytokines, when they interact with the neuron, are going to cause issues with DNA synthesis, going to cause mitochondrial dysfunction, issues with protein synthesis and protein folding. And over time, when that cell becomes chronically weakened, it can't send its appropriate impulse. 
So the brain becomes compromised and you would experience this uh, if you've ever had, you know, transient brain fog, issues with short-term memory loss, chronic headaches or migraines, um, motor issue coordination, anything of that nature is a sign of basically silent inflammation in the brain. And as exactly. I can see, you know, chronic mast right cell through. activation, which, you know, is yeah. the biochemical reason that we, you know, came up with this just for people that don't understand that, which I'm sure everyone does. So you're about to cut someone off or you get cut off in a car, you get super red faced. That's a mast cell reaction. It's supposed to go away. A lot of you right now, your brains are in that state 24 seven. How do you, how long do you think your body can keep up with that? So something like this can help calm down, you know, your microglial cells into a way that we at least balance that piece out so we can get to work at, you know, the root cause. Yeah. How this product fits into my mind is, is if the, the brain's compromised and we know it, the gut's compromised and we know it, we have to protect the brain as we're dealing with the leakiness. So, you know, using three capsules twice a day for someone who's dealing with a lot of brain inflammation that's a lot. Absolutely. The best, best way to go. If it's severe, three capsules a day is probably your best. Every person dose, you got to play with it because everyone's going to respond differently. Some people won't even be able to do three. They may have to start with one or two. I recently spoke to someone that three upset her stomach, but two was her sweet spot. You know, so as a clinician, you know, each and every one of you, uh, you guys have to figure out, are sweet you dealing spot. with a canary yeah. in a coal mine? Are you dealing with someone you can throw anything at them? Of course. So much more we can touch on this one, but yeah. Time to move on. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll say that for a special lecture. Right. <laughs> the sun spectrum, anti-inflammatory on two different fronts, also microbiome supporting. So you have the hydrolyzed guar gum. You have one of the best forms of curcumin that I'll let you get into because you have a, a great you know, little spiel on that. And we have coenzyme Q10, which is both an antioxidant and a mitochondrial support. And this was formulated by Dr. Kevin Connors, and he deals with a lot of cancer, correct? That is correct. So... Both Kevin and I were the big neurology nuts, but also he has just felt that his life needed to be dedicated to work with cancer patients. First, it was chronic, chronic Lyme, but then it just moved to cancer and like really sick cancer patients. And I'm like, Kevin, what's missing from the market? And we both just got done reading Brain Maker. And he's like, we need to develop a gut healing product that will work on the gut and the microglial cells and the liver without glutamine and without firing the mTOR pathway and without firing, you know, some of the things that glutamine can neuro, you know, trans, you know, neurotrans wise. So he's like, these are the four things that we need to put into this product. And from there, I just took it to like, okay, I'm going to find the best four that I can as a person that has access to raw materials rather than just doing, you know, a typical doctor formula. Like, these are the four things, you know, wherever they come from, let's just make sure they're clean. So all four of the ingredients in here are branded, which means that they're heavily researched and they have patents behind them. So the sun spectrum, the C3 reduct is just an amazing, it's completely 100% water soluble curcumin, which is pretty much unheard of. It's white. It doesn't taste like anything. And it has a three times greater half-life than regular curcumin. And it has a, a bioidentical Q10, ubiquinol, whatever you guys want to call it, um, from Kanika, which has also been deeply, deeply researched for you know cellular health. And then we went with the BLO4, which we use in sev several of our products, which is probably the best you know inflammatory calming bacteria that we've found to this day, you know, research-wise, you know, especially for IL-10. Yeah, beautifully said, and and it's important to understand kind of the mechanisms of action here, you know, so. The hydrolyzed guar gum is going to feed the bifidogenic bacteria. It's going to help stimulate the production of butyrate. So what does that mean mechanistically in the, in the colon specifically? That's the preferred source of fuel. It's also a, a directly anti-inflammatory molecule for two reasons. One, it will calm the, the production of inflammatory cytokines, but butyrate also acts as a mitochondrial stimulant. And anywhere you can increase energy production in the body, which CoQ10 will, Co Q, Co Q10 rather, will piggyback nicely, um, that's going to help really regenerate those GI cells because they're the fastest replicating cells in the body every three to five days, which is why it's you know encouraging. Leaky gut is one of the easiest conditions to heal quickly if you get all the variables right. And curcumin has a, you know worked on a similar pathway that a Tylenol or an aspirin does. It blocks the upregulation of those 
lipo and cyclooxygenase enzymes, which stimulate the production of infl inflammatory cytokines. So yep. using, you know, a half a scoop is probably good to start for most people. Especially if they're like SIBO, quote unquote, you know, start mm -hmm. maybe, you know, maybe even a little bit less than that, but talk to your rep. We have things that we can, you know, walk you through on patients like that. Um, but yeah, this is, you know, a brainchild of someone who's far brilliant, more brilliant than I am. And it's, it's been a, a big home run for a lot of people. Yeah. And it's nice not just throwing glutamine at the gut, which can actually yeah, convert to glutamic acid and, and glutamate, which is a stimulatory, excitatory neurotransmitter. Yeah, fire mTOR and all these can burn things. out the neurons. Yep. Awesome. So theanine, probably the unsung hero of the amino acid category. So theanine actually does a great job of kind of neutralizing what we just talked about, the upregulations of glutamate and neuro and excitotoxicity. So theanine can also help stimulate more of a, a little bit more of a parasympathetic state in the brain because it chills out the, the central nervous system, correct? True. Well, <clears throat> that is true for L-theanine across the board, which does have a hard time getting across the, the BBB. But if your patient's BBB is, you know, smashed up, which most of ours are, it will get across, but this is a micronized version, which will get across even after we heal our patient's BBB. And this one has been shown to be like an adaptogenic for brain waves. It's the best way I explain it. So alpha, delta, beta, theta, if they're high, low, it's going to help bring them into balance. So in the morning you take it, it's going to give you a nice little boost, especially if you take it with your morning coffee and you don't like the jitters, it will help it's a caffeine antagonist, but you still get the little benefit from the caffeine. And then at nighttime, it'll help calm you down and help you stay asleep. So it's not going to help you so much fall asleep, but it helps you stay asleep. And studies show that if you slept for seven hours, you'll say it felt like I slept for eight. So it's just a, a really beautiful supplement for managing brainwave function. So, uh, you know, for our functional neurologists and gut brain managers, all you can do it's got a defleeting return. So one in the morning, one at night, it's got a 12 hour half light, 12 hour half life. If you take, you know, three or four of them, it's not going to do anything other than if you just took, you know, the one. Yeah. It's interesting to note that the reason people feel more chilled out when they drink things like matcha green tea is because of the high theanine content, which kind of, as you mentioned, works with the caffeine to give you a more sustained tabletop rather than that sharp up and down. So, you know, right. I think it's a, it's an underutilized supplement and what's, really good is it's working to correct an area that I think a lot of people struggle with. And that's autonomic nervous system regulation. It helps to bring you back into a more chilled out state. And, you know, when you're sleeping, you want a Delta brainwave to be high in a theta. When you're up in the middle of the day, you want some alpha yep. and some beta. And if you're, you know, off in the other dimensions, you're in gamma. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Which we won't discuss until our energy. Uh, there you go. Exploration. <laughs> but that, uh, that does it for today. I know we threw a lot of information at everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh...